twenty ninth is a miss. Sure, sure. Um, so today, last time we talked about what glaucoma was, and what glaucoma was not or is not, right? Okay, and uh, see who missed that. Let's see, you missed it, and you were you were you were here. Okay, so you're the only person that wasn't there. Okay. Okay, so at some point we'll do a little review, a real quickie review of what we covered in depth. Okay, but t today's the second of our five lecture series. And again, at the end of the five lecture series, we would intend that you would be very knowledgeable patients. Okay? Well, don't try to be an expert, but uh, we're not even experts. You start to find out when we get toward the end, you'll realize how much we don't know about glaucoma. So you'll be uh, up with us where you don't know, you know enough to ask good questions and, and to interact with your doctor in a way that will benefit your care, hopefully, if you use it that way, okay? So um, we talked last time about what glaucoma is and isn't, and this time we're going to talk about what different types of glaucoma there are, okay? And we're going to talk about the different testing procedures that we use in our office and the... Um, and the frequency at which they should be done and what we look for and how we use that information in making decisions. Okay, so that's, this is a very integral part of what we do. Once we know what glaucoma is, we then can figure out, now what do we need to measure about patients so we can find out how they're doing? And then what do we do with that information? Okay, so how, how many of you thought glaucoma was uh, one thing? But glaucoma is glaucoma. Yeah, most people, how many of you knew that there's more than one kind of glaucoma? Right, okay, good. There's literally 50, 60 kinds of glaucoma. Well, it's all different, at least, I'm sure that we'll keep coming up with new ones, but probably 50 or 60 different types of glaucoma. I could have, I'd have to really make a list, but it goes on into a very strange permutations. Let's talk about glaucoma types for a minute, and then we'll go back and we'll cover a little bit of last week for you, okay? Let's see. So we have some basic ways of dividing diseases into categories, and it's very arbitrary. So you sort of have to follow it along for a little while, and then it'll make sense. We call glaucomas, we use the word primary. Now, that's a strange word. I really don't know how primary glaucomas. That's, when you first hear that, you say, what the heck does that mean? And then it'll make more sense when you hear that they're secondary glaucomas, <laughs> right? Secondary glaucomas. And they're actually easier to describe. Second, D-A-R-Y, secondary glaucomas. Now, if I try to describe primary glaucomas to you, it'll be confusing. It's easier to say, here's what the secondary glaucomas are, and then, then you'll understand the primaries. The secondary glaucoma will be that it's secondary to something else. For instance, you get punched in the eye, and the drain in the eye is damaged. Make sense? And then the eye gets, develops glaucoma. It's glaucoma secondary to trauma. Injury, trauma, right. So we have traumatic glaucomas, and there's different types of those. Trauma. Any of you know what other things can cause glaucoma? No, not particularly, not directly. Um, how about um, diabetes? Right, diabetes causes a particular kind of glaucoma. It can cause something called neovascular, new blood vessels. Neo means new. You'll find, out, you'll find out that a lot of our words are not very, are more descriptive than, an under, than show a real understanding. Neovascular means we see new blood vessels in the eye, and what they do is they, they grow into the drain of the eye and clog it up. And then you get a secondary glaucoma, and this neovascular can occur in a variety of different settings. It can occur when somebody has a clogged up blood vessel, like we call a vein occlusion, a vascular occlusion, occlusion. It can occur because somebody has severe diabetic retinopathy, diabetic 
retinopathy. Anybody ever hear that? That's what diabetics get when they have glaucoma, I mean when they have diabetes for many years and they develop new blood vessels in the retina and it overflows into the front of the eye and it all ends up doing the same thing. Um, you can get it from severe inflammation, you can get this, but then you can get inflammatory glaucomas. <laughs> inflammatory glaucomas. In other words, the eye gets inflamed. Inflammation. Secondary to inflammation. You can get what's called uveitis. It's a disease where the eye gets inflammation in it, often without a, call, or without a real known reason. And the, the eye will have a lot of um, uh, debris inside the fluid, which makes it almost as though the fluids become thicker. And therefore, the material, the debris in the fluid clogs up the drain. Ultimately, the bottom line is, in these secondary glaucomas, the drain gets clogged up by one reason or another. Now, we can go on for a long time on this, and I could bore you to tears when we get into some of these very unusual glaucomas. But what I want to make the distinction here now is between, once you get a little bit of this, and the primary glaucomas don't have a cause that we know of. Okay? So the glaucoma seems to be a primary... I'm trying to say it in different ways so you'll get it. The glaucoma seems to be a primary condition. There's nothing else causing it. It occurs all by itself. And then those fall into the group of patients that we don't know what causes their glaucoma, but they have glaucoma. So they have primary glaucoma. That's what something about 90% of the glaucomas are. Okay. Now, of the primary glaucomas, about 88% of them are called open-angle glaucoma. So I'm going to take another cut at glaucoma, not just looking at the cause, but we're going to look at something called the angle. And this is a bit confusing to people. How many of you have heard that word? Open-angle, closed-angle glaucoma? Okay. This will make some sense to you shortly. So we have primary open-angle open angle glaucoma and then you have primary closed angle we could say where we tend to switch the words around and say angle closure just the terms that we use but it means you could say it either way angle closure glaucoma now this is the great majority of them here in fact it's the great majority of all glaucomas that occur without a cause where the drain is open now we're going to have a little overlap between the testing, which I'm going to go over over here. But there's a test that we use when we look in the eye. I'm going to jump over here, and it'll make sense this way. Some of the testing that we do, one of the things that's very important to do whenever I meet a new patient is I look in the drain of the eye to see whether it's open or closed. It makes a big difference in the whole sense of treatment. We have to treat them very differently once you make the distinction. So one of the things we do is something called gonioscopy. That's going to be a real real word, for, really strange word for you. G-O-N-I-O-S-C-O-P-Y. And that what we do is we look at the drain. Now the drain is also called the angle in the eye. Now. So the, when you look in there with gonioscopy, you see if it's open or closed. Now, in the front part of the eye, if you, when you look at somebody's eye and you see the colored part of the eye, do you think if you touch their eye, you would touch the colored part? No. no? How many of you think, how many don't know whether you would or not? I mean, how people don't know this? Actually, what do you think you run into? You run into something that prevents you from touching the colored part of the eye. What's a... Well, besides the fact that their eyelid's going to blink, let's say they weren't alive and <laughs> they couldn't blink and you could touch their eye. What do you think? You, there's a cornea. The, the cornea is a clear cover. So actually the colored part of the eye is underwater. Right, it's inside the eye. So there's a clear covering over the eye that you look through to see out. It's sort of like a window pane. It's curved. It, has, it does a lot of the... Uh, refraction of the bringing, making the light way, the light rays converge on the retina. The cornea is a very highly curved front part of the eye. 
And when between the cornea, which is clear, and the colored part of the eye, you can imagine there's a, there's a space in there. Now, they come together at the outside of the colored part of the eye. Okay? You can imagine that? I'll, it's a dome, right. But they actually do come together. There, you're looking at somebody's eyelid. There's the colored part of the eye here. And there's this clear dome called the cornea over it. Now, right here, they come together. The dome touches the cornea and the iris sort of come together all the way around. So there's a circular area all the way around the outside there. And that's where the drain in the eye is. That's where fluid goes out. Contact lens would fit right on the surface of the cornea. Then the, on its sides, it might cover the whole thing. Right. Some lenses are very much, they're very big, they cover the whole thing. So the, um, the fluid comes into the eye from behind the colored part of the eye, comes up through that pupil, and then it goes out through this drain all the way around the outside. It's, not, it's circular in shape all the way around, right? The drain's not like one little hole like in your sink. It would be as if your drain had a, um, a groove all the way around the outside of the top, in a sense. So it's, it's a long, it's a big area. So when we do this gonioscopy, we look in here. And when we look in, we can actually see, when we look in, we put a, a little device on the eye. I just happened to bring mine. I don't want to pass it around because invariably somebody will open it up and this glass thing will break on the floor. But this, you numb the eye with a numbing drop and you put that right against the eye. And it holds the eye open for you. You don't feel it, it doesn't hurt smooth. But you can see it's shaped to fit the colored part of the eye. You numb the eye. Yeah, you put that right against it, right against it. And you'll notice, if you look in there, there's, there's a mirror going off. There's four mirrors in there, you see that? There's, it's mirrored on the back side over here. And you look in the mirrors, okay? See that? And it gives you a chance to look in the drain. And you see it in four different parts. So when you look in, what we see, we see the pupil as if we're sitting inside the eye looking that way, looking toward the drain. And we see the pupil coming out, and we see the cornea coming down, and we see that circular area where they come together. Now the drain is sort of like a slit that's right it usually has a little pigment in it. And we look at it, and we can see pretty quickly whether it's open or closed. It's not a very hard distinction. When it's wide open, it's not a hard distinction. And then you can know right away whether the angle is open. And that helps classify the glaucoma into the different types. So if you go to the doctor, especially if you're a new patient, and you say, I have glaucoma, just tell me what I need. Make it, give me a quick answer. Well, the first thing we have to say is, well, okay, what kind of glaucoma does this person have? So you have to look in the drain to even begin to answer their questions. So you look in. If the angle is open, you know they have open angle glaucoma. Well, this kind of glaucoma is usually where you get the fluids thicker. The drain's open also. So just because it's open doesn't mean that you have this glaucoma. The secondary glaucomas are also subdivided, <laughs> it gets complicated, into two types. You have open angle, <laughs> and closed angle types of secondary glaucomas. It gets confusing, doesn't it? Well, it isn't confusing really at all once you get the hang of it because you have to realize that what you have to do is characterize this one patient. And once you've characterized them properly, you can then, that'll have a big influence on how you're going to set up a treatment plan. But once you characterize that person, what kind of glaucoma you have, then you can begin to know that person, whenever they come in, oh, they have secondary open angle glaucoma due to trauma. Oh, now that means something to me. That means certain drugs will work better than others to that person. It sets up a whole sense of thinking. So 
it's, conf it's only confusing to you because you're trying to understand all of it, but all you have to know for yourself is what kind do you have. Now, how many of you here have an idea of what kind of glaucoma you have? Do any of you know? <laughs> I know you, if, you're, if you have glaucoma, you say, okay, I have glaucoma. But do you know what kind? Interesting. Okay, so what's the first thing you're going to do when you go back next time is you're going to say to your doctor, what kind of glaucoma do I have? Right? <clears throat> we're going to get to that later because we're going to talk not only about what we do but how often we should do it. But yes, it's definitely done in the beginning to establish a diagnosis, yes. And it, does, it should be done periodically. If, if the glaucoma is suspected, you mean? Ah, here we go. Another distinction of types. Now we have the glaucoma suspect. <laughs> now, you have to realize that when you say a suspect, it sort of falls outside of this category because you can take any one of these and call them a suspect. It means you're suspicious, but you're not sure they have it. But you still have to characterize the type of suspect they are. And the characterization is the same. So we have this, I'm going to put it down here, but only because I don't want to have to, you don't make a whole new set of rules just because they're suspects. Then, in other words, if it's borderline, for any of these reasons, you could say they're suspicious. Now, what, some of them it's not so true because if they have neovascular glaucoma, which is a type of, open, well, it's a type of angle closure glaucoma, but it's secondary angle closure glaucoma. I'm not going to get into too much of the details there. Then, if they have it, they have it. It's not like, are they a suspect or not? It gets, the suspects are more up in here, in the primary glaucoma. The secondary glaucomas, since there is some event that caused it, they usually show up with florid glaucoma, and there's not an issue as to whether they're a suspect or not. Okay, and you have to also realize you're talking about like 90% of the cases are up in here, and a lot of these people get glaucoma slowly, so they're suspects along the way to getting it. So they're still, so really, if you're talking about suspects, you're usually talking about this kind of glaucoma, okay? So it's not that complicated, really. It's not like this taints the whole thing. You getting a hang for some of this now? A little bit? Good. Okay. Oh, absolutely, yes. If somebody's a glaucoma suspect, you still characterize them in the same way. They should be, that should be done to determine what kind of glaucoma suspect they are. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, so, so your question was, should you do this all the time, even if they're just a suspect? And absolutely, yes, it's important. It's very important. Now, so what this word primary really means is we don't know what's causing it. So in most cases, we're talking about a disease, but we don't know why they have it. So what I'd like to do is get a little more into the differences between these two. So if we look in the drain and it's wide open, it's real obvious. Sometimes we look in the drain and we see that it's, the iris and the cornea sort of are almost, the iris is sort of bulging up almost as though it's shaped close to the same curvature as the cornea. So that would mean that the angle is narrow. Boy, now that is that confusing. Hmm. We have open, we have closed, and we have narrow. Yeah, that's somewhere in between. Okay, so you can have a narrow angle, which would make you a angle closure glaucoma suspect. Okay, because you don't quite have anything else wrong, but the angle's a little narrow, so that's a suspect for glaucoma too. Make sense? So the angle, when it's closed, when you really have this, we look in, what closes it is the iris comes up and clogs up the drain. It, it's, somebody, it's almost like somebody took glue and pulled the iris up into there. And it might be closed. Now, if it's, if it's closed almost anywhere, we call it angle closure glaucoma. But usually, it's very narrow as it's closing. And it's very, very important to make this distinction between these two types. Very important because we can do a very simple laser procedure. Now, we'll be talking about laser procedures at another time on another session. But very quickly, you make a little hole in the iris with a laser, 
to let the fluid come through. It's, it's not so easy to understand. But what it does is it lets the iris drop away from the, uh, from the uh, drain so that you won't get any more areas where the drain will clog up. It stops the drain from clogging up any more than it is. So it's very important we make this distinction early on so that we can do this laser procedure. But once you've done it, then you treat them as though they have the other type of glaucoma even though this is what they may have. So the importance of gonioscopy is really to make sure somebody doesn't have this glaucoma and during treatment over the years, many years you're watching them, make sure that while you're treating them they don't develop it without you recognizing it. So yes, this has to be done at initial, this needs to be done initially. See we're getting into the treatment here a little bit. The testing, I mean, a little bit. Initially and then periodically. And now periodically might be in somebody who's got a very narrow angle or it's starting to close and the patient won't let you do the laser or you're not sure you need to do it. You might do it every three to six months. But if it's clearly wide open, it might be done as infrequently as every three to five years. Okay? Yeah. That, well, but I, so you're asking, your question is, is you're having a hard time understanding what, how we make this distinction? When it's closed, it's well, uh, let me show you with my hands a little bit. It's like this. Normally, the cornea has a curve like this. The iris is usually flat, like this. So when they come together, it's like this. Okay? Now, when it's narrow, the iris will be up like this. When it's closed, it'll be, watch my fingers here. It'll look like this, and the drain's right here. It'll go. And then it's closed. The angle is the, is the space right, but right here at the very edge where they come together. The drain is right there where they come together, just above it, at the junction. Now the fluid that goes out there, you wonder where does it go? It goes out through the wall of the eye and into the blood vessels and the lymphatics around the eye. Can I, wait, you're saying just by looking in we can determine what? Open, whether it's open or narrow or closed. Right. Okay, so, right, so your question is can one type of glaucoma evolve into the other? Yes, it can over years. Yeah. So over the years, the open angle glaucoma can get an element of, can develop on top of it another type of glaucoma, which also leads me to tell people how devastating it can be when somebody who already has glaucoma, maybe they have open angle glaucoma, and then they develop, because they have high pressure in their eyes, they develop a vascular occlusion perhaps, and develop this on top of that. It's very devastating. So it's not uncommon for people to have more than one type and to go from one to start out with one that never really goes away. Once you have one of these, you really have it. And then you can develop another one on top of it. But the big concern why we repeated periodically looking in there, in other words, why we repeatedly gonioscopy, or gonioscope the eye, is because a lot of people will develop angle closure glaucoma as they get older and they don't have it to start with. And sometimes our treatment can actually cause the angle to get narrower or closed. So it's very important we look periodically. Is it easier than to treat the It depends. Your question is if you have a combination of these, if you uh, diagnose it and do the laser, does that um, make it easier to treat? Is that your question? Yeah, sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Um, it depends on the nature of the drain and how scarred up it is. If, if it's completely closed already, you do the laser, it won't open up the areas that are closed and it won't help at all. If, however, somebody has a lot of this closure which is very recent, 
and has occurred in the last few months, then you do the laser and it can reopen. Now, that um, leads me to talk a little bit about the one, normally we say glaucoma doesn't have any symptoms. You've heard that before, no symptoms, you just lose your sight. Once in a while, glaucoma can be painful. This angle closure glaucoma can occur on different levels. It can occur slowly, gradually, and almost look like present with no symptoms and a lot of visual loss, but also it, the drain can suddenly massively close, the pressure suddenly shoot up, and the eye become very painful. And we call that acute glaucoma. Acute, sudden, painful. Chronic is the type where it closes slowly without any symptoms. And often people will have some of this and then suddenly the rest will close and they'll present to our office with a pressure of 50 and a lot of pain throwing up. And in those cases where it's acute, the laser will, will break, not only help break the attack, but it'll open the drain and actually sometimes restore them to normal and it's almost as if the glaucoma is gone forever. So that's why we find it extremely important if somebody has a strong tendency to this, and maybe it's in their family, and we do the gonioscopy, and we diagnose it early, and get to the laser early, we may prevent them, almost cure them, of the tendency to have that glaucoma. It's one of the few, really, in, few interventions we can make that are almost complete, where there's, it's, it's gone forever. Now, a lot of people have a combination of them, and it's not so simple. And doing the laser doesn't really make that much different ex difference, except that it prevents the drain from going on and closing more and more. OK. Now, I want to go back just for a minute for, for you, for somebody here who didn't hear the what is glaucoma, what it isn't. The bottom line of that was what glaucoma isn't, it's not pressure, OK? Because that's the big thing people think it is. Pressure is a risk factor for getting glaucoma. And what glaucoma is, is damage of the optic nerve. Okay? That's the bottom line of what we talked about last time. We spent an hour and a half going over that in more detail. And how the pressure relates into, we got into a nice discussion about that. Um, what, we, what, we, what I want to talk next is when we do the testing next piece of testing is looking at the optic nerve and that's why I wanted to bring that up because the optic nerve is the site of the disease and we're going to call this we're going to the testing we're going to do is ophthalmoscopy which means look in the eye <laughs> ophthal is eye and moscopy has scope in it M -O -S -E -P. ophthalmoscopy Here's, there's a scope in here it's looking in Ophthal is eye, not such hard words really. To see that scope here is looking in the drain, looking in the eye. Now you can do ophthalmoscopy to look in the eye and look for all kinds of diseases. You can look for macular degeneration, you can look for a lot of things, but we're going to particularly look at the optic nerve here. And we're going to say, okay, how do we look at this optic nerve? This is one of the important tests that we do. Now remember, the optic nerve is the cable that connects the eye to the brain. Brain and two eyes looking out, right? Optic nerve right there connects the two, okay? When we look in the eye, we're looking at it head on. And what we see when we look in the eye is a panorama of the inside of the back of the eye. And we see this Inside that view that we get, we see a little hole, sort of, where the optic nerve comes in, as if, if, if you could look at the back of the blackboard, it would be sticking out this way, see, from behind. Okay, and you're looking at the optic nerve on end. Do you have to use that instrument that you showed us? No, that instrument was for looking in the drain. Well, that, that instrument looking in the drain? That was the looking in the drain. That was, gonio, it was a gonioscope, one of different types. So when we look at this optic nerve, we zoom in on this couple millimeter object in there, and we can blow it up and look at this thing, this circle here, here. And what we see is that it's pink when it's alive, and it's white when it's dead. But there's a shape to it. Remember we talked last session about recupping, right? It's the word we're going to use. 
but there was characteristic changes of the optic nerve. Remember, if you cut the nerve in an injury, then the nerve turns white. But there's a characteristic way the optic nerve looks when you have glaucoma. It has what we call, as you mentioned, a cup. And what that cup looks like is a, a hole. And it's usually white in the middle. And the live nerve tissue is pink. And what we want to look for over time is change over time. So we, if it looks like this one year and the next year, you've got to realize the, the pink is the alive tissue. What do you think would happen if you lost some alive tissue? The, 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 the cup here, that's the cup, gets bigger. More like the rim gets smaller, not that the cup gets bigger, but we, we talk about the cupping. Let's say next year it looks like this. Okay, now, if we see this happen and a couple years later it looks like this, we say their glaucoma got worse. Because remember, we define glaucoma by the optic nerve damage. Okay, so we're going to look at the optic nerve and how, are we gonna, how do we get a good idea of what it looked like last year? What would be a good way to know? What did it look like? Take a picture. Photograph it. How many of you have had a photograph of your optic nerve? Only one of you, okay. It's a good idea that people have this because it's better. And there's another way to do it. You can draw it. Draw, like I just did. My charts are full of my drawings. We can make it look literally this big, like I'm looking at it right now, that big, like as big as your head if I was that far away from you by magnification with different devices. So we can draw it very carefully and look for subtle changes. It doesn't take much of a smart person to see when it changes this much, but when it changes just a little, why wait another three years to get more aggressive with somebody's glaucoma? Why make them lose more if you can detect it sooner? So if you can detect it in one year, why let them go 15 years and lose a lot of sight? So we want to draw the optic nerve, photograph it periodically. Hmm? Snapshots. There's a camera, you put your head in the machine, and it has a flash, lenses in it, and we focus it, we look in the camera, we see your optic nerve, and we take a snapshot. Boom, bright, bright light, it gets on, on slide film, we put them in the file, and we look at them with special glasses, and we get two images of each nerve, and we can see depth perception. Remember, it's, it's a three-dimensional surface, this optic nerve. It's, the retina is flat around it, but the optic nerve can go back. Remember, you're looking at it on end, just like the top of this has a little hole in the center, sort of like that. We draw it and we sort of make depth notations and all kinds of things about the shape of that nerve. Okay? And the stereo photographs we take give us depth perception when we look at them. So we're pretty good at documenting it. The important thing is to do it. So when should this be done? When would you do it? When would be a good time to do it if you were a doctor? The first time they come, absolutely. So you do it initially. So you guys are getting the hang of this now because you're realizing that glaucoma is a disease of change over time. And then how often should we do it afterwards? Well, that's debatable. And you know, a lot of insurance companies, Medicare, they're looking at these issues like, okay, if the patient comes in and the doctor takes a picture every three months, that's a little, that's a lot. But if they wait five years before they take the next picture, that's probably too little. So what's the right amount? Well. No, it's every year or two. Year, yearly, or two years. Now, of course, if something happens to the nerve where it changes, you don't wait. You take another picture to show it. So your question is, if glaucoma happens more rapidly, of course, if it ha that's what I said. If you look at them in six months later, it's changed. Well, of course, you would take another picture. Right, so you would, uh, depending on the case, everything varies depending on the severity of the case. Yes. Yeah, and then if there doesn't appear to be any change, you take it every year or two. And what's interesting is when you see somebody for five or ten years, and you have a set of pictures every couple of years or every year, and you can go back and look at the optic nerve last year's picture, and then quickly look at the pictures that were taken 
10 years ago. It's like time-lapse photography. If that nervous change, you'll see it. You see, so that gives you a real sense of security when that nerve is not changing over time. Okay? So this is an important part. What other tests have you ever heard of? How? Well, the pressure test. Yeah, well, that's, that's important too. Of course. Well, it's not, I don't want to emphasize the pressure too much again. We've got to get, we're going to, because when, why are we testing the pressure? Yeah, the, that was what I was looking for, but let's do the pressure. Why are we testing the pressure? Because we're treating the pressure because, this is a review of last week again, uh, we treat the pressure because it's the only thing about glaucoma we can alter. We can't change all the other risk factors like race, age, family, history, age. Can't get rid of those things. So we alter the pressure. So how often should we measure the pressure? How about every time they come in? Oh. Ah, good question. Every visit. Okay, here's some broad guidelines for you. If somebody's a suspect, six to 12 months you see them. Unless you're very suspicious. <laughs> if they have um, controlled glaucoma, I'm talking about real glaucoma now, not suspect, real damage. Controlled glaucoma, three to four months. If the pressure is controlled and the disease is not getting worse, that would be how we be how we define control. If they're uncontrolled, uncontrolled, there's no rules. It depends on the situation. I'm not sure. I'm not going to tell you because it depends. It might be every three days. I have a I did a laser on today, and uh, tried to do something to get his pressure down in the office, and it went up into the 40s. So he's coming back tomorrow. Okay, so it depends on the circumstances. You're asking me about stress, can it raise the pressure? That's, a, that's another subject for another day, but briefly, there's no correlation that we know of. Mainly because we can measure pressure, but we don't know how to measure stress very well. We can look at them and... Yeah, and what's, yes, that's true. We don't find that to be the case with the pressure in the eyes that we know of. I have people say, oh my God, I'm so stressed today, I know it's going to be up. And when we measure it, it's lower. I mean, it doesn't seem to correlate. Plus, people's perception of their stress doesn't always match what other people say about them. A husband or wife will come in and say, oh, he or she's totally stressed out. I look at them, they look, they look like the husband's more stressed out than the patient. And so their assessment isn't always what I would agree with. <laughs> Stress does not cause pressure as far as, well, we don't know because we don't know how to test it. That's what I was saying. Yeah. Is your operation that you performed on this man you're telling us about considered trauma? In a sense, yes. Yeah, in a sense it's traumatic in his case because he's now got inflammation coming from his trauma that makes it on top of this, which has made it go up temporarily. He'll get over it, though. But he's... If somebody's a suspect for glaucoma, well, I'm going to save that question because that's, that's a little more than I want. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that. I really, it's not really, I don't want to get to, I'm going to miss, we're going to get way late here. You're asking me if glaucoma is glaucoma, whether it's primary or secondary? Yes, Why do you say glaucoma is glaucoma? Mm, I hear you. So you're saying so all since all of these affect the nerve. Well, I'm trying to establish is how you can tell if, you're, if the nerve is affected. How do you decide, except maybe for hearing loss, you can tell if you're getting any kind of stress or not. Okay, so okay, you're asking me. Okay, if the nerve's damaged, you know somebody has glaucoma. Now you have to go back and figure out which kind they have, right? Yeah, well, you're saying you're starting from the fact they come in. There's a there's a damaged nerve, and then you have to figure out what happened. Well. Usually, these leave telltale signs on the examination. So you can look in and see if the eye's been traumatized. You can see injury scars. You can see clefts and tears in the drain if they've had trauma. 
Um, if they have neovascular, you can see blood vessels growing all over the front part of the eye. If they're inflamed, you can see the inflammation. These are evident, self-evident kind of things. It's not very difficult to figure out whether they have this or this. And then you can look and see if the drains open or close, and you can tell whether they have this or this. So, no. <laughs> Absolutely. The examination, well, the history helps you too. I mean, if sometimes I'll see somebody and it looks like they've had obvious trauma to the front of the eye, and you say, uh, you ever have an injury? Not really. And you say, well, when you were younger, did you ever get in fights? Like, yeah, I was a boxer. And I used to get hit in the eye all the time, black eyes. Okay. He didn't, that wasn't an injury to him. Yeah. So you're saying all of the glaucomas having one thing in common is that they damage the optic nerve. That's right. That's, right. That, that's, that's true. Damage. Yeah, so but, right. Right, or have that tendency to cause, that's what, that's what we're there for is to protect this bugger here, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're doing. Can I ask yes. you when you have under pressure control, what do you mean by control? When you have pressure controlled. Oh, okay. That's a little more complicated. That sort of gets back to the other question. So the question here is, how do you know whether it's controlled or not? Okay, well that would, um, were you here last time? Because in the last session, well, when we talked about uh, what glaucoma was, is and what it isn't, we talked about setting a pressure goal. Do you remember that toward the end? We talked about if the, seeing what the pressure was before treatment so you know how low we should try to get it. That was whether, when you make that decision, how low it should be, and your doctor's made that decision about you, and it should be written in his chart somewhere how low it should be, and you should know what it is, okay? That's an arbitrary thing that's decided by taking everything into consideration you know about this patient and deciding where you want the pressure to be to override all the other risk factors, okay? So you then, it should be a number, though. It should be down to a number, a simple number, 14, 18. I mean, it shouldn't be something... Uh, it's made up every visit. It's not based on how you're feeling today. Well, you might be trying. I hear what you're saying. Okay. No, this is, doesn't relate to whether you've lowered it at all. It relates to whether you've lowered it enough to meet the goal that you set. Okay? So I hear you. You're trying. Trying doesn't count in this case. You have to get it or not. <laughs> Okay, if you started out 40 and you got it down to 20, but you really want 10, that's uncontrolled. But sure, 20, 20 is better than the 40 it was at. How are we doing on time? Good, doing fine. Okay, so he told, somebody mentioned the visual field. That's the other big piece of this puzzle that I want you to know about. Visual field. Now, what is the visual field? Anybody, um, how many of you have had a visual field test? Probably a lot of you have had it, right? Yeah. Unfortunately, right? It's a long test. Uh, the visual field is your side vision. It's a, now, a lot of people will say, gee, I know I have good side vision. I see my hand here, and I see my hand here. I'm fine. Now, you've, the, but that is, a, that is a measurement of the visual field. That's a rather gross measurement of it compared to what we do with our machines. Our machines take and put you in an environment where the lights are controlled. The background illumination of the bowl is controlled. So your eye, you know how you go out in the dark and it takes a while for your eye to adjust? Well, there's certain background illuminations and lighting conditions that make it easier to test the glaucoma and find the defects. So we get the eye just sitting there long enough to get used to that. And then we have you look straight ahead and we monitor how well you keep your eye fixed straight ahead. And then in your side vision, a light is projected into the bowl that you're looking in, in the side of your vision. But it's not just like a flash bulb and it's not as big as your hand. It's a dim light and it's done with computers now so that we can try to make an estimation of how well you see in a whole bunch of different parts of your visual field. Now we can't test every part of your visual field or it would take hours and hours and hours and hours to do each eye. But what we do is we test a certain sampling of points 
and they use a tiny spot that's called a size three target as a standard, which is about arm's length is probably about that big. And the machine can vary the brightness of that light compared to the background. So what we're trying to do on that field test is find the dimmest light you can see in 72 approximately locations in your vision. And the way it does it is in each spot, it makes the light, um, it starts out projecting a light you should see. If you don't see it, it makes it brighter and brighter and brighter until you do see it. And then once you do see it, it makes it dimmer and dimmer and dimmer again until you don't see it again. And it comes up with a numerical number for how sensitive your eye is at that spot in your visual field. That's a lot different than do I see my hand waving, right? <laughs> but you can imagine how complex it is and the machine's in the midst of doing this at random in 72 different spots. And it remembers where it is in every spot during this algorithm of varying the light to try to find it. So it doesn't stay in the one spot. You know it's coming back there, it's coming back there. It's, it varies it, so it's testing here. And it remembers where it is at each spot. And then it prints it out. You, I, float, I don't want to talk about floaters right now. No, floaters have nothing to do with this discussion. I'm going to show you something. I want to get you used to looking at some of these things that come out on the computers, okay? And Bill, can you um, get a close-up of some of this? Okay. This is a good, this is a printout from an Octopus computerized perimeter, which is a, one of the major brands of computers that does this. This is the raw data. Every computer printout, you've probably seen pages like this in your chart, and it looks like total Greek to you. But there's three parts to every one of these printouts that I want you to understand. It's not very complicated once you know what to look for. This is the actual test results. You'll notice that there are, there's a number in a lot of different locations. This is each of the locations that was tested. And there's a number. The higher the number, the more you see. The lower the number, the less you see. Okay? So the higher the number is, the dimmer the light was that you could tell. It's sort of an inverse relationship. So the higher the number, the dimmer the light was. So that means you have more sensitivity to light in that spot. Okay? So this is a normal field. Now, how does it know it's normal? Well, each machine has age-corrected normals. So it usually brackets people by 10-year age groups. So people between 70 and 80 should see approximately like this. And what this print out over here does is it's comparing you to the normal person of your age, what you should see. And all these little pluses here means you pass the test on every one of them, which means this person was normal in every spot. And then it has what's called a grayscale, which is nice to show patients, and it's nice because it helps your eyes zoom in on the areas that are abnormal. And look how nice and evenly gray that is. Okay. Now, each machine has a little difference in the amount of grayness of its normals. And it, if, you just change the, if you change the printer and you get a new inker on the machine, you know it's going to be darker. It might look a little darker one time or another, but you have to sort of know what you're dealing with. Or if you make, if you make a couple photostat copies of this and then fax it to somebody, it's going to turn darker looking. So you've got to be a little careful when you look at the grayscales. But I'm going to show you how you can look at your own field next time you go to your doctor's office and you won't feel like you're lost when you look at it. So here's the actual values. And you notice they're in the 20s and 30s. That's sort of in the mid-20s would be good numbers, just as a general rule. Okay, when you start getting below the 20s, there usually there's abnormal spots. And this is an even grayscale. Okay, so you've got three things to look at. You've got the actual values, the difference table, okay, and the grayscale. Okay, now I'm going to show you another field. Here's one other one. What do you think about this? First, what jumps out at you? It's the grayscale. The grayscale. It's real nice, the grayscale, because it lets you, lets you, your eye jumps right to it. Okay, so the grace, the darker the spots, the lower the sensitivity, the more blindness. Okay, so what you don't want is your field to turn dark. 
Okay, so if that was if the last field was your field two years ago, and now you got this field, how would you care, how would you feel about the care you're getting? It's gotten worse. Well, that's what we're trying to prevent. So obviously, this has been unsuccessful. The treatment, if this is this, this isn't the same patient. These are these are illustrations, so you'll get to see. Now, this is sort of typical of what glaucoma will do. I'm going to move this aside here a little bit. This is a um, yeah, this is a right eye, and this is a field defect at the top over here. And you'll notice here, the numbers down here are threes, ones, you can't really see them, but threes and ones low compared to the numbers around it, which are in the 20s mostly, okay? And the difference table over here is showing a lot of, showing, got to get my bifocals adjusted. They're showing the numbers around five or six, so it's the difference from normal is not very great, except here. It has some black dots, which means it's the difference is like since they don't have any sensitivity, it's infinity. You know, it's infinite, it's zero sensitivity there. So those are abnormal, very abnormal spots. And of course, the grayscales are obvious. I'm trying to show you an idea of what goes on as it gets worse. And here's a much worse visual field. Look at this one. Right. Absolutely, that's exactly what happens in glaucoma. Is it starts out just a portion and it gets worse and worse and spreads often around the center. This is the classic story of tunnel vision. Now this person thinks they have normal vision in the eye because he can still see his hand. Now isn't it nice that these field machines will find the damage before he can? And actually look how bad it is. It's pretty bad. But he still can see to get around. These are a lot of zeros out here now. But right in the center, you got 20s, 29 in the middle. These might have 20, 20 vision. Okay? But that's pretty obviously wrong. Now, if you look at your field now, you, that would scare you a little bit, right? Look at all the dark spots, at infinitely abnormal around here. And there's a couple little pluses right there near the center, which says some of it's still normal compared to his age corrected normals. Now, what happens when it gets, sometimes this small tunnel vision gets so small that it's not worth doing the whole test in that big an area. That's about a 30 degree field. We'll sometimes do a special test that zooms in on the center. So we'll put all the tested points in. Why should we bother testing all these areas where the person can't see anyway? So we can program our computer to do our testing more in the dead center. And we zoom in on the center. This is another person that has even a smaller little bit of vision. Now this zooms in on the central 25 degrees, but it concentrates a lot of the tested points right near the center. And you can see very few of them are still there. This person probably doesn't think they see real well, but they might still see 20-20. Because tw your 20-20 of your eye is all in the very dead center. It's a only a very small spot in the very center that's all your vision, that you, when you concentrate on details. That's right. And this person, if he has a normal, relatively normal other eye, may not go to the doctor thinking he has a problem until one day he gets a bug in his good eye and he goes like this and realizes he can't see very well. Okay, so that's why it's not silently, slowly sneaks up on him. So I think if you go to your doctor and you look at your field, you're going to have a gross idea what you're looking for, right? So I want you all, the next time you go, say, can I see my visual fields and let me look at them. Will you do that? Will you? Hmm? Well, good. You should look at it and let's see and say, let's see if it's changed. Explain to me if it's changing. Now, there's there's other different machines. So you're saying, oh, if once somebody's blind, no. that's lowering the pressure won't bring the vision back. Is that what you're asking? No. That's right. The only, the only thing we can do about somebody with glaucoma, once we know they have the disease, is to correct the pressure, lower the pressure. But th that does no good to the person who's lost all their vision. Well, it does some good. If they've lost all their vision, it does no good. If they've lost most of their vision, it might keep them from losing the rest. By lowering the pressure? By lowering the pressure. But why don't you just lower the pressure and save all that? That's the whole idea. Yeah, you're saying, so why not get it early, lower the pressure, and they won't lose any sight, right? 
Well, we're, that's what we're. That's what my job. It's my whole life is about that. That's what we do is to lower the pressure enough so that that doesn't happen. That's exactly right. You can arrest the progression. You cannot bring back the lost vision at this point in time. Well, by lowering the pressure by a lot of different means. Now, this is a little different field. This is just to show you the different things we can do. This is a much larger area of the field that we're testing. And we're testing it with a spot size 5 target, which instead of being that big, is maybe that big. And this makes a big difference because this person's lost their center vision. All they can see is off to the side. They can't see 2020 or even 2200 anymore. This tests the side vision out to the side. And you can see the crosshairs are with the center where it's dark. And they still have some side vision left. So this person probably feels this vision is, is not very useful. Although they might be able to walk around and not bump into chairs with it. So there's different ways you can use these visual field tests in order to test different parts of the vision. And depending on the stage of the disease, we do different programs with different spot sizes. Making sense to you now when I say this? And different size of tested area depending on what's left of the vision. Because if we took this person and tested them with that program in the very center, the whole thing will be black. Okay, so you have to find the right test for the right person so that next year when you repeat it or ne whenever you repeat it, you can do a comparison. Okay, now, glaucoma is a disease of, yes, and it's a disease of change over time. Change over time. You'll notice everything we're doing is, is documentation for change over time. So let's see, what do we do with the visual field? When should we do the first one? Right, now what might we find out the first time we do it when somebody comes in as a suspect? What, 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 we're, what are we going to just separate there when we do that? Initially, what might we find? If they've lost vision or not. So what this is going to help us do is establish a diagnosis. We want to know if there is any damage because sometimes some people are born with optic nerves with big cups. Is that normal or abnormal for them? They might have high pressure. They might have a family history of glaucoma. They might be black. They might be high nearsighted person. These are all risk factors. They could have all those risk factors and we don't know do they have glaucoma or not. Are they a suspect? We know they're a suspect because the optic nerve looks suspicious. Let's say the pressure is borderline. Do they have glaucoma or not? We don't know. So what do we do? We find out the angle's open, so now we know they're in a primary open angle glaucoma suspect. So you guys are understanding the words now, aren't you? Makes sense, right? So we, we knew that. We looked at the nerve already. The pressure was borderline, we said, right? What are we going to do? We'll have them come back. And what are we going to do? We're going to do a visual field. And what might we do when they come back? What else, might be, what, what else might we do when they come back besides do the visual field? Check the pressure. Now, that's right. Check the pressure. Now, why would we want to check the pressure again? It varies. Right, that's the point. It varies, and it might not be borderline next time they come in. This is what every, you see the every visit? Got it? Now, let's say they have damage on the field test. Now, what do we say they have? And it, is, looks like, it does look like glaucoma. Again, you know, the optic nerve, when it's damaged, if somebody's cuts their nerve, they're going to have field loss. The optic nerve has characteristic damage and the visual field has characteristic damage too. Okay? So the field loss should collaborate with the optic nerve. In other words, if the damage is in one part of the nerve, it should, it should support the diagnosis, should match up with the, everything should match together. So the visual field should look like glaucoma, not look like a stroke. Follow me? Okay, so let's say they have field loss that looks like it's glaucoma. So now what do we say about this person who is a suspect? What do we say they have? That's right. Now we take the word suspect away. They say they have primary open angle glaucoma. Well, you already did check the angle the first visit. Because that's how we knew they were a primary open, open angle suspect. Okay, I'll run you another scenario. Well, let's, do, let's finish the field thing, and then we'll run some more scenarios. You're starting to get the hang of this? Yeah, it makes some sense. It all fits together. 
Okay, visual field initially for diagnosis, how often should we do it again? If they're, again, um, we'll do them periodically. It depends on a lot of things, right? If they're a suspect, we might do it every one to two years. Yeah, we, we might have them come back for fresher visits very frequently, but only do the field every year or two. Now, if they really have glaucoma, it's usually every year, if controlled. And what if they're uncontrolled? <laughs> We're back to the controlled and uncontrolled. Uncontrolled. Question mark. <laughs> it might be much more frequently than that. It might be every three months sometimes, certain cases. If we think it's getting worse rapidly, somebody asked how fast, does it ever get worse rapidly? Yeah, sometimes it does. And in that case, you have to do the field often enough that you want to catch it on the way to going blind, as you were saying, right? You don't want to let them go blind. Okay, so, ah, now, let's run another scenario. Okay. They come in uh, for a routine exam, and you, for some reason, you suspect they have they might have glaucoma. Maybe my technician looks, and they say, "Oh, their angle looks narrow." And they can tell that just from looking with the slit lamp when they check the pressure. So I go in and I look. Gonioscopy. The angle is very narrow and closed in certain places. Pressure is borderline. I like to use borderline so it makes it more confusing, but it also helps you make distinctions. Okay, the optic nerve is healthy. Okay, optic nerve still healthy. This is where it gets a little confusing. Okay, and the visual field's normal. Let's say we do a field that's normal. What do we call that person? Angle was closed. We didn't find anything else wrong with the eye. I forgot to tell you that. Okay. So we got primary angle closure glaucoma, but what did I say? The optic nerve is normal. Now, didn't I say glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve? Here's the exception. <laughs> there is structural damage in the eye, but it's not in the nerve yet. It's only up here in the drain. So technically, we call it glaucoma, but it, it's the exception. Now, if I told you that in the beginning, you never would have gotten the whole picture of what glaucoma is and what glaucoma isn't. But that's, that's the exception. This is one of the reasons we have problems with nomenclature, naming things. And we're in the midst of trying to come up with a better classification system that takes into account the things that we've been discussing. Okay, so now you have a sense of what kinds of glaucomas there are, what kind of testing you need, how often it needs to be done, and what kinds of factors go into determining the frequency of when we should do these tests. Okay? And the treatment for the laser and why that's important. Now that's something I, we're going to have another session on laser surgery and regular surgery as one combination topic. But this is so important. You can see if you came to that and people come in there, they don't, under, they don't understand what the difference between the pressure and the glaucoma is. They don't understand the different types of glaucoma. It's real hard to understand that. Okay. Well, it really isn't now that you understand it a little bit. It's, it's, it, is, yeah, it is serious. When it's bad, it's serious. Okay, so we're done the basic part of the lecture now. So why don't we just go ahead and take some questions from you guys, and then we'll, we'll probably go home in about another 10 minutes, okay? So anyway, let's hear your questions. And we can talk about floaters if you like, too, if that's an issue. <laughs> You were asking about macular degeneration last time a lot, too. Now, does macular degeneration enter into any of this? Yes, in one way. It doesn't enter into, it's not because, because it's not glaucoma, it doesn't enter into the classification. But it does enter into some of the visual field testing. Where do you think the uh, damage on the field would be if somebody had bad macular degeneration? Right, exactly, somebody right in the dead center. And that's not characteristic of glaucoma. You see what I'm saying? So. The macular degeneration does enter into this, but because it, 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 if it affects your vision and it bothers people's vision, it affects the field. Everything shows up on the field. Okay? 
any real visual problems people have will show up on that field, but it might not look like glaucoma. It would look like macular degeneration looks on the field, which is a, just the opposite of that one with the tunnel vision. It would be black in the middle and open and white on the outside. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Well, very good. All right. Why you? I don't know what your question was. I cut you off when you started, so I don't know what your question was. <laughs> It doesn't affect the visual field, it doesn't affect the gonioscopy, it doesn't affect anything else, but it makes you crazy. If there are a lot of floaters, it makes you nuts. It's, it's just, they're, they're irritating. They're irritating, but it's not, it's not a, you get nothing you can really do about them. They're a pain. Except hope they go away with time, which they often do. So, hmm? Oh, floaters are just opacities in the clear center of the eye. There's a vitreous gel in the middle, and as you get older, sometimes it collapses and condenses, and it forms little opacities, and it casts a shadow on your vision. So when you look around, you see something black moving when you move your eye. Yeah, like a bug. I used to have one. I, most, most people have floaters at some point in their life. Most of the time, yeah. Well, they usually, they, it usually happens when the vitreous collapses, and as it collapses further, it moves away from the retina, and you can imagine this. If you have a, if you want to cast a shadow on, a, on the carpet, if you have a little object, the closer you have it to the carpet, the better shadow you get. So as it falls away from the retina, it just tends to bother you less. Right. Right. <coughs> what do you call that? There you go, traumatic. It's a type of trauma. We don't like to think of our surgery as traumatic, but you would, you would say it's a type. This would be an injury, and another type of injury would be surgery. So it's a, glauc it's a traumatic glaucoma, post-operative glaucoma, and it can cause open angle or closed angle. It's very common. I don't want to get into that. That's very confusing. But yes, it can. Cataract surgery can. It's very common that after... And that, we're going to have a whole separate session on uh, cataract surgery for the glaucoma patient. And we'll talk about that there if, you, if you'll be around. I think that's the last session. That's, a, that's such an important topic and such a big issue today with so many people that we actually have a separate talk just on that subject. A higher incidence of glaucoma. In other words, do glaucoma patients get cataract? Oh, Patton has been on the TV. 
Yes. Patinol is an, is an allergy medicine. It doesn't really relate to glaucoma. Yeah, that it's for, for eye, itchy eyes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's probably a good drug. I haven't used that much of it, though. I haven't prescribed that much of it. Oh, this is, it has to be only given twice a day instead, I think, of uh, three or four times a day. It's a good drug. Patinol. It's, it's a good drug, but I don't think it works for everybody. It's for... It's not. It's for allergies. It's a particular problem for people who have like hay fevery eyes. Yeah, so it's not for dry eyes and other problems. So it's dangerous to listen to it and to do what they. Well, it says that on there, but if you. You should hear the way they. Act. Yeah, I've seen that ad. I've seen that ad. I know. Get it then. And you had Thank a question, you very so. Much. Sure. Um, you said that you do cataract surgery, but are you primarily? Is your um, field primarily glaucoma? Yeah. But with glaucoma, I have glaucoma patients, and when they get cataracts, we take them out. But primarily, you are a specialist in glaucoma and also in cataracts, but primarily glaucoma. Well, you can't be a specialist in glaucoma without dealing with a lot of cataracts, because that's one of the biggest problems that comes up for people. And a lot of the people I do have glaucoma surgery on also have a cataract, or get a cataract, or have a cataract at the same time. Yeah, a lot of people ask that though. They always say, well, gee, do you do cataract? I thought you'd just do glaucoma. Well, you can't do one without the other. They're very intimately related. All righty. All righty, so we're done for tonight. Thank you. And the next Wednesday we'll be back and we'll talk about, I think, is it medications next week? Is that what it's about, right? Um, yeah, I think it's medications yeah. next week. So next week we'll bring that, we'll go over that green list. You coming next week? No, we're going to be out. Oh, okay. Say it again. <laughs> uh, if you actually don't have glaucoma, if you've been diagnosed right. as having it, but you really don't, you've been doing medication and you're taking it. This is very confusing. You're saying if you've been diagnosed with glaucoma, but you really don't have it. Okay. So, okay. So, what you're really saying is you don't have glaucoma, so could med. Okay, so you went so you're on treatment for pressure, but you don't have glaucoma. I'm not. <laughs> this is a very confusing question. If there was a misdiagnosis, but you're still taking glaucoma and medications, right? Can you does it work? You have to worry about different taking taking different pills. Is that what you're asking? No, just just the eyes. Is it harmful? Is medication? So in other words, is the medication that the person's taking that they shouldn't be taking harmful to them? I'd, I'd have to, it depends on the circumstances. It's a, it depends on the circumstances. <laughs> and which drug and what other conditions they have in their eyes. It's, it's not a yes or no answer. After that green sheet you gave us and you showed medications and you showed the effects, I don't like the effects if I should have them. Yeah, we'll talk about that next week. You coming next week? Yeah. <laughs> I hope to, yes. Good, okay, we'll talk about that. All righty. Well, thank thank you. you for coming.